Thursday or Friday. Yes. Um, and now Sunday. I it's know. Easter. That's crazy. And this one is special because not only is it our fourth and last worship experience for Easter, but who do we have joining us also today? I know. I didn't. I love quizzing you on Ooh. hosts. It's so great. We have our online tribe with us today. So for we 11 o'clock, we stream online. Yeah. So we've got people watching on YouTube, on Facebook. So if you're in our worship space right now, and we haven't said this in any of the yeah. other ones, but if you're in our worship space right now, you can actually go to our Facebook page or our YouTube channel and share the link and have somebody join us, another person join you yeah. online while we experience Easter here for our last worship experience. Of course, we would love to see all of you people. We would. It's pretty exciting. So, hey, if you are new, we know we get a lot of new people for Easter. Maybe you're a guest. You came with somebody. Maybe you just wanted to get back to church, and it was Easter, and so you found us. Um, we are Mosaic. This is our host moment where we just kind of take a few minutes before service starts, and we tell you upcoming events. We let you know um, any celebrations. Yeah. Kind of let us uh, or let you guys meet some people that go here, right? We're normal people that go here yeah. at Mosaic and serve here. Um, and so Mosaic is, we have a mission to be a church for people that don't think church is for them. And so that really, uh, the, the stories that we often hear, the stories from ourselves as well is either, maybe we didn't feel um, at place or at home, I guess, in a, in a different church, maybe depending on where your church experience was, it's been a while, but it never really felt like it was for you. Um, or maybe it, you never thought that you could walk into a church, right? We all have past, we all backgrounds. What, can I even do that? And we just want you to know um, that you are welcome here, that you, we want you to be comfortable. We want your guards down. It is a come as you are church. It is. Man, if you come in sweatshirt, if you come in pajamas, if you come in a suit, like you're welcome here. Whatever We're so you glad you're do, here. Yeah. So every week we have three services, right? Three of them, yep. Why don't we tell them what they are? So we have our Thursday night. Uh, which is at 6.30. And then yes. we have two Sundays, which are 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Yeah. Um, really interesting. Um, they're just super fun services. They are. And a little segue into our next topic. Uh, I'm a youth leader here, so our Thursday nights are a high school focused um, night they are. where we kind of get to just focus on high schoolers. Yep. Um, and then our Sundays are more geared towards middle school, uh, fifth through eighth grade. Yep. Exactly. Super fun time. Um, high schoolers, we don't have a place for you to meet, but um, we would love for you to sit in the sanctuary or come help us out in youth. On a Sunday. We would love, yes, on yes. a Sunday. Yeah. Yes, Thursdays, definitely come join us yep. over at the uh, coffee shop. Right, um, King Street Cafe right next we door. We also have an awesome kids ministry. We do. So our kids ministry is called Mosaic Kids, and it's from birth to fourth grade. So if you've got kids, maybe you brought them today, um, and they're you can check them into Mosaic Kids, or maybe it's something you check out in the future, whatever it might be. We have awesome leaders, volunteers. Uh, we have amazing kids programs, teachers. Teaching, all the things like it's so cool because they're all leveled out for you know your kids age uh, developmentally where they are and just engaging ways for them to learn about Jesus yeah. and and learn about how God wants us to live yeah. and what that looks like so um, that's pretty cool that we have that so if you're interested in that right at the end if you come in our if you came in our front doors it was the whole way in the back but there's a big sign that says mosaic kids that would be your place to go to and if you have questions about youth uh, Logan would love to answer those I'd love to, and yes. introduce you to other youth pastors in that ministry as well. Yes. So um, also, if you're new, we would like to welcome you again. Yeah. We have some interesting ways you can get involved and get connected. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at the front uh, of the building right now where our connection corner is. Mm -hmm. After service, that's where Pastor Adam will be. He'll be happy to talk to you about the message. Uh, just talk to you about life, yeah. share experiences. Yeah. Um, we also kind of in the middle area, right outside of the doors of the sanctuary, we have our um, welcome desk. Right. Where you kind of right. get to go and just kind of talk to people. and. It's like a involved. hub. It is. It's like a hub yeah. for all information around Mosaic. All information, yeah. <laughs> um, which is a really cool way to get involved. Uh, we also have connection cards on the backs of your seats. You can fill those out with your name and some basic information. Mm -hmm. uh, and that'll let us just kind of get to know you a little bit better. Um, and you can turn those into the welcome desk and get a free shirt. You can. Yeah, you can leave them on your seat. If you're like, I don't want to talk to anyone, that's fine. You can leave it on your seat. Someone will grab it and connect with you this week. Or like Logan said, if you take it to the welcome desk, you can get a welcome packet as well as a uh, mosaic free t-shirt. And then also just, uh, coming up, not this Tuesday, but the Tuesday after, April 9th from 6 to 7.30 here at Mosaic in the lobby space, we have something called an open house. And that's just a space 
There's not on a Sunday or a Thursday for you to come meet some key staff, some volunteers, get some food because we have dinner for you. Maybe get a tour of the building, ask questions about uh, who we are, our values, our beliefs, anything like that. And it's a cool way to meet other new people, right? So on a Sunday, you don't know who's new, you know you are, but you don't know who else is. So an open house kind of connects you with people that are new and you can kind of all connect with one another. So we do have some really awesome upcoming events. We're we getting do. closer to summer. Yes. We have a lot planned. So we have a couple ways that you can kind of stay in the loop with that. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of events on our event page on our website, yeah. uh, which you can go to and kind of see stuff and, and see what's coming up. Right. We also have our newsletter, which um, we have physical copies at our welcome desk and at our mm -hmm. coffee bar. You can also sign up to get those online on email. Yeah, you can. If you just go to that welcome desk again or go to the connection corner, or find one of us, we can help you get signed up for that yeah. email as well. So obviously we're in Easter right now, so that's our big event. Like I said, please share this. If you're here, share this um, link on Facebook or on YouTube. That way we can get more people in. We've had full services for all of our Easter services. It's just so amazing to be here together with everybody. It's been so fun. You know, Thursday, Friday, now today, and this is our last one to celebrate a big, um, you know, big celebration yeah. of, of Easter and what it's Jesus did people, for us. Yeah. So, and then after Easter, so starting up, gosh, Next Thursday. Week. Yeah. Oh, so Thursday, literally yeah. Thursday would start off. Something cool's coming up. We have a brand new sermon series. Yes. Uh, it's called How to Christian. It's mm -hmm. kind of the basics of what it looks like to be a Christian, um, how it yeah. looks like to live as a Christian. Uh, as well as it's kind of a good segue into our new mosaic group called New to Jesus. Yeah. Um, this will start up April 14th, uh, along with some other awesome, interesting groups. Yeah, we have some really cool groups that are starting up. I'm biased because I'm our groups director, but I think they're the best. Um, so we have new groups. We have a table in the lobby, kind of across from the coffee bar. So if you're out here in the lobby, you want to check those out, also go online. That's our other hub. But if you are just coming in, welcome to Mosaic. We're so excited to celebrate Easter with you. Quick ways to connect. Welcome to Ask Connect Corner. Come see one of us. We would love yeah. to talk to you, just we chat would. a little bit, uh, get to know you. Um, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. And there's information on the seat in front of you. You scan the QR code. It gives you kind of some key information about us and some different ways to get involved. But here we go. Last Easter this worship experience it, here at Mosaic. So thankful you are here. Have a great day and happy Easter. Happy Easter. Come on, get up on your feet. You got thunder in your vocal, you got flames in your eyes. You got wonder working power pouring out of your side. Check the tomb all the way through the grave with empty inside. Ain't no other pool, the greatest miracle of all time. You got power, demons cower when they hear your name called. You got power that still towers, make Goliath look small. You got power to devour any counterfeit roar. Even your tongue is a sword, count up the score. You are the Lord.
elders said to me, don't weep, look, the line of the tremors victorious so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, coming on the clouds in all his glory. Oh, hail the Lion of Judah! Sometimes you gotta stand on 
Jesus, you do. You deserve it all. The highest of highest praise. We are here for that this morning, Lord. Thank you for your, your presence. Pray that uh, we would be aware of that. Pray that every person in here would have uh, their ears open, their eyes open, their, their hearts and souls open to what you want to do this morning, Lord and awareness of your work. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. Well, happy Easter, Mosaic, here we are. I don't know if you know this, this is, uh, this is our fourth Easter service right here, right now. Somebody, I forget who it was, somebody came up to me and goes, hey, so this is your fourth time, this is gonna be like the best sermon, right? Yes, to totally, that is gonna happen. Uh, so listen, if this is your first time or first time in a long time, welcome. I'm, I'm super pumped you're here. My name's Adam. And uh, I have this thing I believe. It's, it's a deeply held belief. Uh, I don't know. You, you might not hold it, but like for me, I believe that like no matter why you think you're here, that God actually had a plan for you to be here. And I mean that like even if like your wife made you come <laughs> or, or somebody kidnapped you, coerced you, tricked you bribed you, I don't care what it is, uh, even if you're sitting here going, I don't wanna be here, I actually still think that God wants to do something, that he wants to show you something, that he wants to, to show up in your life today. Um, I think it's just me, but I, I think he wants to work in that way. Uh, and that was to emphasize the point, I don't know. <laughs> was that you? That was you, wasn't it? Look at you, it's all right, thank you for participating, that was good. <laughs> All right, so I have four kids, uh, two teenagers, a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. So my house is mildly controlled chaos most of the time. Other times it's an absolute hurricane of, of madness. Um, so one of the things I've heard about parenting that I've found to be true is that the, the days are long, but the years are short. Any parents attest to that? The days are long, but the years are short. It's crazy. I don't know how kids have the ability to manipulate time like that, but I can say in the same breath, I can't wait to put you to bed. And how are you three years old already? Like they're both, they're both true somehow at the same time. Uh, so I have, I wanna say a decent amount of parenting experience now. Not enough to give any advice, but I just have some observations. Um, and so my observation, and, and this is true of mine. I, I don't know if it's true of yours. I, I imagine it is. Um, but my observation is that kids have uh, the supernatural ability uh, beyond science, and reason and explanation to make messes. I don't know how they do it. That's not the superpower I was praying for my kids to have when they were born. Something else would have been cooler, but mine got mess making ability. Um, and especially for the little, so my teenage son is sitting in front of me right now, so I'm gonna walk over here. Not totally, not gonna make fun of you. Um, it's the little, man, the little ones, it doesn't make sense because like how, how big they are versus how much time they have does not seem to equal the amount of mess that they can make. It just seems like there's some kind of dark magic mixed in that, that, that they're able to do that, super natural. 
Uh, so one of the things I do just about every week, and this is, this is crazy, is I, I sweep under the couch cushions. Who, t- who does that? Like there's like two or three people who are like super neat freaks, like you do that all the time. You've always, like, that's your thing. Not me. Like, man, before we had kids, I, don't, I never even looked under the couch cushions, like unless the remote control got lost, like there was no reason to even go under there. But now it has to be a routine because if I don't, there will be an entire Happy Meal <laughs> underneath the couch cushions. Like no joke, four piece nugget, French fries, couple of toys, throw in some apple slices, it's all there, it's all there. So if you're ever like, we need to go to McDonald's, just come to my house and get some underneath the couch cushions. Another thing, close your ears, another thing, is so I have two boys, and uh, do, you, do you know about the bathroom? So if you don't have boys and you ever go to a person's house with two boys, you know that, you know that part of the toilet that touches the floor, that back part? Don't ever, don't ever touch that. <laughs> like if you drop something back there, just leave it. <laughs> Even if it's your phone, just be like, I'll get a new one, I'll get a new one. It's gone now. It's gone. I have this theory that like the base of the toilet in, in my boy's bathroom is going to be ground zero for the next pandemic. Like that's, that's where it starts. I don't, I don't go in there. It's icky in there. Um, but one of my biggest pet peeves when it comes to messes, I know this is kind of a weird one, but it's, it's the thing that drives me the most nuts. Um, it's, it's sitting next to my littles at the dinner table, sitting next to, to one of the little ones. And then like 30 minutes later, I feel the outside of my sleeve and it's like sticky, you know, <laughs> or wet or crunchy even. You're left, left to scrape it off of you because you didn't notice, but while I was eating, they, they touched me and their little grimy hands got onto my sleeve. So now I, I kind of sit leaning away, which I love my kids, but I lean away <laughs> because I understand the way messes work. When something dirty, touches something clean, the clean thing gets dirty, right? Um, Works with a sleeve where, you know, when a dirty hand touches uh, a wall, all of a sudden the wall's dirty now. When a dirty hand touches the doorknob, now the doorknob's dirty. When a dirty hand touches the window, now the window's dirty. It's just a, it's a, 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 a universal law. When something dirty touches something clean, the clean thing becomes dirty. You ever got a nice new crisp pair of white shoes? and you're doing really good, and then you take like one wrong step outside. You know that, so you always know when you hit, uh, it squishes a little bit. And now your white shoe isn't white anymore, right? Because when something dirty touches something clean, the clean thing gets dirty. Uh, and that's the way it works, it's universal law. Seems to be something that works on overtime if you have kids. Uh, so today, uh, we are celebrating Easter. Uh, the most amazing thing that ever happened. And we're going to look at a story. Admittedly, it's not the Easter story. It's a story that's going to show us a deep truth about the Easter story. So we're going to look at, at the Easter story through this lens of this story. It's only three verses long, but I believe it'll give us a really, really uh, important insight into the Easter story. So it's in the very first chapter of the book of Mark. Uh, we're going to start in verse 40. Uh, A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. So you got to picture that, that happening. So a man with leprosy walks up, kneels in front of Jesus. He is is, uh, begging to be healed. Now, uh, a couple little details there. Uh, If you don't know about leprosy, leprosy in the Bible was an incurable skin disease. It was pretty gross, kind of rotted away at the flesh. Uh, It was a really bad thing to get. Uh, So so back then, like no medicine, no doctors could touch this. Uh, You you were uh, gonna be sick and it was probably gonna kill you. Um, So that is this man's condition. That is this man's issue. Um, Now I wanna point out what's not there. Did you notice in the verse it did not say his name? You don't know his name. It didn't say, you know, whether he had a family. It didn't say what he did for a living. It didn't say what he was good at. Didn't say his net worth. Didn't say how tall he was. Didn't say whether he was good looking or not. The only thing it said is that he had leprosy. And, uh, or to say it another way, he was only known 
for his issue. Like that's how people knew him. That's like the identifier. Oh yeah, the leper. That's how we know him. And I think that that happens all the time. You ever feel like you're more known for what's wrong with you than the potential that God has placed inside of you? Maybe you ever feel that way sometimes? Like people know you more for, for, for your mistakes, for your flaws, maybe for your past than, than what God is doing in your life. And sometimes that's what people put on us, right? So, so if, you, if you have some stuff, you do some things, you, you've got some, some habits or, or maybe a, a past, people will put that on you, right? They'll almost label you with that. But other times, maybe, maybe we do it to ourselves. Maybe, maybe we over-identify with our problem, with our, with our issue. Um, you ever thought about that before, that maybe, maybe you do this to yourself, that like maybe part of your problem is that you've over-identified with your problem? You ever thought about that? I know if you overthink, now I've just added a whole other layer <laughs> for you to worry about. But like, have you ever thought that maybe the part of your problem is that you've over-identified with your problem? And instead of it being something that you do, now you're starting to think that it's who you are. And that if you do that, just so you know, if you start to say, this isn't just something I do, this is who I am. If you start to do that, what happens is, instead of you having an issue, your issue has you. So I really want to caution you against starting to accept some of your issues as a part of like, who you see yourself as. Uh, you can control your own self-perception. What other people say, that's a different story. But man, really be careful about over-identifying with your issues. Now, this man, uh, he's got this going on in his life. He is known as the leper, even written down in the Bible. This is the way we know him. He is a leper. Uh, now, there's a reason for that for him. In the Jewish world in which he's living, um, leprosy is viewed a certain way. Uh, and that came from the ancient Jewish law, which we call our Old Testament. There were some uh, rules you had to follow if you had leprosy in, their, in the book uh, of Leviticus. So we're going to read a couple of verses out of Leviticus. By the way, if anybody's like, oh, you went to that Mosaic church? They're like shallow. We're about to read the book of Leviticus on Easter. So tell them to shut up. Um, Leviticus 13 verses 45. I'm not wearing a suit either. Did you notice that? Some, never mind. Anyways, it's a purple shirt though. That counts. Uh, verses 45 and 46. Those who suffer from a serious skin disease must tear their clothing and leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth and call out, unclean, unclean. As long as the serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place outside the camp. So like, this is the rule you had to follow if you had leprosy. Now think about that. That is a, there is a visual cue and an audible cue to everyone around you that you've got this, this issue, right? You're supposed to leave your hair unkept. Um, so you're supposed to look like a middle school boy. Um, no, you don't even know. I'm, now, I'm, now I'm piling it on. Um, you're supposed to tear your clothes so people could see you from a distance and go, ooh, hey, ooh, what do you got? What do you got? <laughs> They're supposed to be able to see it. And you're supposed to cover your mouth so you don't get any, any on them. And then you're also supposed to call it out. They're supposed to be able to hear you coming, unclean, unclean. There's, they don't even have to see you to know that somebody's near them that they don't want to be near. And then did you see the worst part? That you have to live in isolation. So like, think about that. This is, our, this is bad. If you have leprosy, this is not good for you, right? Your skin is rotting away. Um, that's, that's horrible. So physically, this is a difficult disease to have. But now you've got a social and emotional burden as well. That you've got to live in isolation? Or in other words, their issue separated them from relationship. Their issue separated them from relationship. And I think that's, man, how many of you know that's true? The issues separate. We see this, the, the bigger the issue, the bigger the separation, right? So you wouldn't argue with that. Maybe you're like, I don't know, like, think about this though. You ever known anybody who maybe has struggled with alcoholism or gambling or addiction of some kind? They have some kind of big issue. That creates big separation, right? You've experienced this before, like, ooh, that's gonna really cause these relationships to, to, to push back. So we understand that when it comes to like big things, but it's true in little stuff too. You know, if you would say like, hey, eh, I'm, I'm a little selfish sometimes. Well, that's going to create, whether you realize it or not, that's going to create some separation in your relationships. It might be imperceptible to you, 
but it's happening. Or you might say, um, well, you wouldn't say, you, well, I'm a little mean. You probably don't say I'm a little mean. You probably say, oh, I just tell her how it is, but you're mean. Ask your wife. Um, but that, that creates separation. Again, you might not notice, but anytime you have an issue, the issue causes separation. The greater the issue, the greater the separation. But with this man, it was even more severe and more like obvious. So without going into too much detail, the, the laws we just read in Leviticus, during Jesus' day, there were some, some guys who, they took that law and they made laws around the law to make sure you never broke the law. So they were like, they called it a hedge around the law. Like they had all these other rules that you had to follow so that you wouldn't break the actual rule. Um, so one of the ones in Jesus' day for a leper is that if you had leprosy, you had to stay 50 paces away from anybody who didn't have leprosy. 50 paces. Now, I don't know if you have like a visual for that, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what this looks like. Um, so I'm gonna walk this out. But um, the reason for this, the reason they wanted this kind of separation is because it was believed that if you touch someone with leprosy, you would get leprosy, right? So like if, if leprosy touches you and you don't have leprosy, you're gonna get leprosy. So they wanted this distance. So we're gonna count this out so you can get a, a feel for how long this is. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Nick Chubb, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty. So now look at this. Look at the distance this is. From one wall to the other wall, this is how far this guy had to stay. From, from anybody in his life, anybody he loved, he had to stay this far away. This was the distance. Think about that. Couldn't, couldn't kiss his wife anymore, couldn't hold his kids, couldn't, couldn't give his buddies a bro hug anymore. Like He had to stay 50 paces. This is the distance. Now imagine what strain that would put. Can you imagine like he's got to have like a, a, a timer in his head like this can't stay. You can't stay at this distance. You got to know that your marriage is going to go downhill if you stay here. Your parenting, your relationship with your kids, all that stuff is being affected by this distance. So you just got to imagine the emotional toll this is taking on this man. It's not just the physical toll. His whole life has been taken from him. Now, I want to talk about uh, something that happened before the verse we just, well, it had to have happened before the verse we just read, okay? So before he approached Jesus, at some point he had to see Jesus from this far away, right? He had to see Jesus from 50 paces away. And he was drawn to Jesus. We don't know why. Maybe he had heard of Jesus teaching, you know, and oh man, he teaches with this authority. It's just different than anybody else. Maybe he had heard that Jesus was a healer, that he could heal. So, you know, oh man, a blind guy can see now. Did you hear about that? That dude who couldn't walk, he's, look, he's walking around. So he's drawn to Jesus. And what I want you to say, the, the, the important part for me that you see, um, especially if maybe you're not a Christian yet, is like, I don't think he had all of his answers to all of his questions about Jesus before he approached him. I don't think he had everything figured out before he approached Jesus. I just think he was drawn to him. So he started, at one point, he, he had to have started to take some steps towards Jesus, 49, 48, 47. And he starts to close the distance. And don't you think there was probably some of his leper buddies were like, hey, hey, what are you doing? I don't, I don't have a measuring stick out, but that's got to be closer. And he's like, shut up, shut up, shut up. And he starts walking. And then maybe the voices inside his own head start. Probably some doubt, right? Why am I doing this? This is stupid. There's no way this is going to work. Maybe fear, because if you, if you close this distance, uh, the, the, for breaking the rule, you get stoned to death. So you just, you just die. You could be afraid. And then I bet, like unworthy, as he's walking towards Jesus, why would he heal me? Of all the people that he could heal, is he really gonna, like, is, I, I don't think I'm worthy of him healing me. Like all that stuff had to be drudged up as he closed this gap, as he walked those 49 paces to right in Jesus' presence. And that's where he stopped at 49. And then did you see what he did? He knelt. 
He took a humble position, a broken position. And notice, (laughs) he doesn't say, hey, Jesus, I've almost got this leprosy thing kicked. (laughs) I just need you to help me a little bit. You know, I'm almost there. Just get me the last five yards across the goal line and I'm there. Like, he he doesn't do that. Essentially, what he says is, Jesus, I can't, you can. I can't, you can. And that was how he approached Jesus. Now, you have to picture this scene. All of this is already wild. For them back then, if somebody who had leprosy was approaching, this is a huge deal. This is a game changer. This is like you you notice this in your day if all of a sudden there's a leper right next to you. So everybody was like kind of doing this a little bit. Everybody except Jesus. So everybody's paying attention. Anybody around, all his disciples, anybody who's around Jesus was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And the next two things that happen are absolutely crazy. They they are shocking. Uh, The first two sentences of the next verse are wild. So here's the first one. Uh, Verse 41, first sentence. Jesus was indignant. Hmm. That's not (laughs) what you expected Jesus to his his state to be, right? Now, if you're following along and you're in a a different translation, it might say that Jesus felt compassion. And I I have no problem with that. So without going into the Greek on Easter, uh, there's a word that they translate. Some guys translate it compassion. Some go with indignant. The word means moved on the inside. I like indignant. And you're like, that's awful. Why? (laughs) Compassion sounds so much better. And you're right. If you look at indignant the wrong way, What it sounds like is this dude just took the riskiest 49 pace walk of his life and indignant, man, indignant has a little bit of anger involved in it. It sounds like Jesus is mad at him for coming, for approaching. Like Jesus is like, ew, what are you doing? Why are you near me? What, you're going to get some of that on me. That's what it sounds like. So I can see why translators went, ooh, let's not use that word. Let's use compassion. But I think you lose something if you do that. So let me tell you why I like it. I think the, the easiest way to understand this is uh, if you can imagine having kids or if you have kids. Imagine your kid approaching you and uh, they, were, they had like a black eye. Their lip was split and they're bleeding. Their nose is bleeding. Scrapes and bruises all over them. Limping a little bit, maybe holding their side. Imagine your kid approaches you like that. What are you going to feel? What, what kind of moved on the inside are you going to be? Now, initially, are you okay? Oh my gosh, are you okay? Right? Like you would, it would be all the warm fuzzies, all the compassion. You'd go into full mom mode. You know, hey, let's like make sure everything's good. Like, do we need a band-aid? Do we need, like you would, you would be in that compassion mode. But at some point in that conversation, you're... <laughs> Your emotion will shift, right? And you're going to ask a question. And if you're, if you're a good parent, you might even growl the question a little bit. You're going to say, who did this to you, <laughs> right? And that is not a warm, fuzzy thing, right? You are angry in that moment. Um, you want to, that is a threat to whatever happened to your kid, right? That is a threat to whoever did this to your kid implied in the tone of the voice. You're mad, not at your kid. You're mad at what happened to your kid, right? Now, maybe when you find out what actually happened, you're also mad at your kid, right? (laughs) But, But if someone did that to them, you're not mad at the kid. You're mad at what happened to them. So I believe Jesus is here. And I think Jesus sees this man coming because Jesus sees everything and he doesn't just see him coming. He sees the man, everything about him. Jesus sees the sleepless night he had the night before because he was in such pain. Jesus sees the emotional toll that isolation is taking on him. He sees the ache in his chest of how much he misses his family. He sees the the social stigma and and, and the the way society is treating him now because he has this disease and the, the shame that this man carries with him everywhere he goes. He sees the cells that are dying and dead and broken that Jesus created himself. And I think Jesus got mad. Not at the man, but at the condition that the man was in. 
He was indignant at the, at the state of this man, at what this disease had done to him, the cost of the disease in this man's life. Jesus was mad about that. I like that. That's better to me than compassion. I like that I have a God who looks to the brokenness and the pain of this world and he has an emotional response to it. I like that I have a God who sees the brokenness and the pain in my own life and he has an emotional response to that. This makes me like Jesus more. That he saw this man in his condition and Jesus was mad about it. No, I didn't create you for that. I didn't create your skin to, to do that. This is not what I intended. And Jesus got angry about it. So Jesus is indignant. That's the first surprising thing. I think once you understand it, it's not as surprising, but when you read the sentence, whoa. Now, the second thing that happens, the second sentence, again, you have to continue to picture the scene. You know, Jesus is here. Now this man is, is one pace away on his knee. Jesus, if you're willing, you can heal me. Everybody else is doing this. You know, like this is way closer than 50 paces. <laughs> And they're backing up. So the thing that happens next, everybody would have, I think there would have been audible gasps. I think people would have like actually reacted to the very next thing that happens. So Jesus is indignant. And then the next sentence, he reached out his hand and he touched the man. Whew. Man, you can't do that. You cannot do that. You can't touch a guy who has leprosy. You can't be within 50 paces of a guy who has leprosy. This was, this was crazy. Again, people would have been like, oh. and it, so, you know, um, one of Jesus' followers is named Peter. I don't know if you know that Peter, uh, we know that Peter was a little bit uh, overprotective of Jesus. You know, he may or may not get out a sword and cut people's ear off. You know, he's like that kind of guy. Like he gets a little defensive of Jesus. I don't know how he stood by. I don't know how this leper got this close to Jesus in the first place. You would have thought Peter would have stepped in. But as soon as Jesus' hand starts to go out, I don't know how Peter didn't jump out of his skin. Just don't do that. You can't touch him. Because if somebody who doesn't have leprosy touches somebody who has leprosy, they're going to get leprosy. That is the way it works. That is the universal law of the land. Jesus, if you touch this man... It's going to get on you. If leprosy touches not leprosy, then not leprosy gets leprosy. If unclean touches clean, then the clean becomes unclean. If a dirty hand touches your sleeve, your clean sleeve is now dirty. If you jump in a mud puddle with white shoes, your white shoes aren't white anymore. Jesus, if you touch this man, you're getting leprosy. Jesus, if you touch this man, you become unclean. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what always happens. Everyone believes that Jesus is about to get leprosy because that's what's always happened. So if they were shocked at that, the next thing that happens is even crazier. Uh, the next verse, so verse 41 and 42. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. What? So, okay, okay, Christian, I know you've read the Bible and this is one of the things Jesus heals people. Yeah, that's cool. I like the way he heals the blind guy better than this stuff. Like, stop it for a second. Can you imagine actually being here? This is in Mark chapter one. So this is one of the first things that Jesus has done. People who have leprosy don't get healed from this. They were already shocked that Jesus touched the man. Now they're going, wait, what? They are watching leprosy just melt off of this man. If there was gasps when he touched him, there's, there's double gasps when they realize that this man who had leprosy a second ago now doesn't have leprosy. This never happens. This is a grand reversal of what was supposed to happen. If Jesus touches leprosy, Jesus is supposed to get leprosy. But instead, what, leprosy got Jesus? <laughs> Jesus was more contagious? <laughs> Does that make sense? No one expected this. This is shocking. This is scandalous. They would have talked about, if this was the only thing that Jesus did, they would have talked about it for years. This is like your kid touching your sleeve and their hand becoming magically clean. This is like you jumping in a mud puddle in white shoes and the mud turning white. This is like your hand touching water instead of your hand getting wet, water getting dry. Like it's the, it's the reversal of what should have happened. 
Instead of the unclean corrupting the clean, somehow the clean infected the unclean. Jesus flipped it. And this is what he does. Jesus just had a way. And if you're like one of those, you know, more advanced Christians, I think this is a part of what it means when the Bible says that Jesus came to fulfill the law. You know, the law was designed to keep us away from the things that would make us unclean. And Jesus comes in <laughs> because, you know, man, if you followed the Old Testament law, anytime you touch something unclean, you became unclean. Jesus shows up and says, yeah, but if I touch you, you go from unclean to clean. He's the reverse. Now, it's just what he does. But what, is this, what does this matter to you? You don't have leprosy. The person next to you hopes you don't have leprosy, right? You don't have that, so what does this matter to you? That's not your issue. Leprosy is not your issue. But you do, you do have issues, right? Can, you, can I say that? I don't know you. Can I say that? Turn to the person, you know, if, if we were a church that's like where I told you, turn to the person next to you. I wouldn't because we don't do that here. But if I was, this is the point where I'd be like, turn to the person next to you and tell them that they have issues. Um, if you're married, you can totally do that. Um, but like, we all know, like, you know that, right? Now you're doing it anyways. Okay, go ahead, willingly, if you want to. You got issues, right? You are a little selfish sometimes, right? You, you, you can be greedy. You, 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 can be, you can be mean sometimes, right? You, you, can, you can not be compassionate. You can, you can completely ignore them. There's a lot of, you, you have issues, right? Some big, some small, you have issues. Now, the Bible would call that sin. And I know some people are like, ugh, I don't like that word. Listen, I don't, I don't get it. Because nobody argues for, for anybody in the world to be perfect, right? Nobody's like, I think there's, and nobody would be like, I'm perfect. You wouldn't stand up right now because your wife would just tell you to sit right back down, right? Like, come on. We know nobody's perfect. So when the Bible says that we're all sinners, that's kind of what it means. Hey, nobody is perfect, and you already agree with that. So if you say, hey, I have issues, hey, I'm not perfect, what you are saying is, I'm a sinner. Okay. And I don't think you'd argue with that. Maybe you don't like the label, but that's what it is. So if you accept that, and you should, maybe the next thing you would do is to say, well, okay, so what? <laughs> I'm a sinner. So is everyone else, according to what you're saying. What's the big deal, right? And I get it. All eight billion people on the earth, we're all in the same boat. So maybe you would want to downplay how important that is. But um, I picked this story for a reason. So this, this leper has this issue, this physical issue, and it creates a physical separation, right? He has to stay 50 paces away from anybody he loves. And that's a physical truth. But your issues, yours are spiritual. So you have a spiritual issue and a spiritual separation. And this is no small thing at all. Look at Isaiah 59 too. But your sins have separated you from your God. Whew. Okay. So your spiritual issue is creating a spiritual separation. Your sin is separating you from your God. That's a huge deal, right? That's a huge deal. If we understand that he was in emotional distress because he was separated from the people he loved in his life, then you gotta know that your soul being separated from God is a huge deal to your soul. Your soul was created to be connected to God. That your soul longs for that whether you realize it or not. And, and if you don't realize it, I just want to say there's a reason nothing has satisfied you in your life. You've been searching for relationships or status or, or money or whatever. You're looking for all this stuff to satisfy. The reason it's not working is because your soul was created to be connected to God. That's the thing that will satisfy on that deep, deep level. And this says that your sin separates you from God. You're, you don't have that connection because of your sin. And it's killing you. It's killing you. Now, Jesus does what Jesus does. Let me read you uh, one of the coolest verses in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So you have this separation and Jesus comes and he dies on the cross and this says he was the offering for your sin, for your issue, that he took your sin 
And now you can have the separation closed, that you can have a relationship with God, the thing that your soul longs for, you can have that now because of what Jesus did on the cross. He took it. He, he paid the price so that you could be connected to God on the cross. Now that's the best news ever, that you, you can be connected to your creator. That is amazing news that Jesus did that. But here's, here's the reversal. Uh, it's even crazier than that, if it, if it can be. Uh, Psalm 103, 12, look at this. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. <laughs> so that, what a reversal. This is, this is crazy. The sin that was causing separation, now Jesus separates you from that. So, so your sin, your issues that was causing the separation, Jesus took that on the cross and he chucked it across the universe. And it's still going. Your sin is as far as the east is, is just going to keep going. It's, it's, it's out there and it's traveling away. That's where your sin is. Gone. As far as the east is from the west. So he separated you from the thing causing separation from him. You follow? He separated you from the thing causing separation from him. That is the, the greatest reversal. Now, how does that work? Maybe you're sitting there going, yeah, I want to be connected to God. So what do I, what do I got to do, right? That's what everybody always thinks. I got to do stuff, right? What? I got to start praying, read my Bible or something, come to church. I'm sure that's what you want, pastor. I do. But um, is that it? Do we got to start doing a bunch of stuff? You got to, you, got to, you got to work your way to God. You got to close this separation. Well, let's go back to our story. This leper approached Jesus. <laughs> Can you imagine? you imagine if this leper takes this terrifying 49 pace walk and stops in front of Jesus? Hey, if you're willing, you can heal me. What if Jesus would have been like, so listen, man, what I need you to do is go, um, could you go like take care of some of your leprosy? <laughs> could you like just get, just get rid of a little bit? Of, could you like clean up a little bit? Like fix some of that. Come back when you've got some of it taken care of and I'll take care of the rest of it. Can you imagine if that's what Jesus would have said to him? He would have had to walk away. It would have been over. No, this guy came to Jesus. He approached Jesus with all of his leprosy, right? He didn't get rid of any of it. He didn't clean up one bit because he couldn't. So he approaches Jesus with all of his leprosy and he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean every bit of it. So this is how it works. You approach Jesus with all your sin all of it. You don't go try and clean up first. You don't go try and take care of some things first. You don't try to, you know, do some good things first. No, no, no. You bring all your sin to Jesus, all of it. The stuff you, you, you can't seem to kick, that one sin too, bring that one and that other one and that, that thing that seems to keep coming back up. You bring all that sin to Jesus, all of it. And you can just, it can be like the simplest prayer ever. It could be, you could pray a prayer. You could do this right now. You could pray, Jesus, <laughs> I can't, you can. It could be that. It, it could be, Jesus, I, I, give you, I give you my life. It could be, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Look at this. It could be the prayer that the leper prayed, Jesus, make me clean. And that's it. You approach Jesus exactly as you are, exactly as you are, broken, humble, here it is, I can't, you can. And what happens in that moment is he does the thing, he, he touches you and your sin melts off of you and he takes it and he chucks it across the galaxy and it just goes as far as the east is from the west and you're clean, you're cleansed, you're forgiven. You could do that right now, exactly as you are. No pre-work required. You approach, you're humble, you ask. And this could be the beginning of your relationship with God. You could do this right now in your own spirit. You could do this. The beginning of you following Jesus right here, right now. Now, maybe you've already done that, right? You're already a Christian. You, uh, you already asked for forgiveness. You already had an encounter with him. 
Um, so let me ask you though, do you act like, with your relationship with God, do you act like your sin is as far as the east is from the west? Do you act like that with God? Or do you act like you still got leprosy? What do you think, Christian? Do you, still, do you still do the thing where you mess up and you feel like you gotta have some distance, like you better get away from Jesus if you messed up? Do you still do that? Like, when you mess up, do you, do you I don't know, punish yourself? Do you avoid reading your Bible and praying for a while and definitely avoid church and definitely avoid all this stuff because you gotta, you gotta like go and do some good things to be able to come back to him? Like you gotta... But it, it said far as the east is from the west. Your sin's gone. That he, when, when Jesus cleansed you, that you were clean, clean. Do you realize like Jesus, when he died for you on the cross, like he knew you were gonna do all this? What even, you know, even last night, he knew you were gonna do that. Even tonight, even a week from now. Like he knew what, like all of your, think about this, all of your sins, when Jesus died on the cross, they were all future sins, right? He's not going, oh, I didn't know they were gonna do that. <laughs> I regret forgiving them. Like, no, he knew, he knew all this. Why are you acting like you gotta go clean something up that he already cleaned you from? Why are you acting like your sin stuck to you when it's traveling across the galaxy? You don't have to separate yourself from God. Actually, the whole point of this gospel story is that when you sin, you can run right back to him. That there is no separation now. You don't have to like punish yourself. You have this unbroken relationship with God because he paid for all your sins, past, present, and future. Stop acting like a leper. You're not, you're clean, you're clean. So maybe, maybe today for you, if you're already a Christian, maybe today can be the day where you decide, hey, you know what? I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not doing this weird separation from God thing. I'm not gonna punish, I'm not, I'm not staying away. I'm getting back to my relationship with God. He cleaned me, my sin still, man, anytime you have this instinct of like, I need to stay away for a while, I screwed this up, I just want you to imagine your sin traveling out past Pluto, out of the Milky Way, it's still going, I just want that image in your head that he separated you from the thing that separates you from him. It's gone, there's nothing between you and him now. Maybe today is the day where you make that commitment to say, no, 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 I'm not running anymore. I'm gonna stay close because he, he did this, not me. Now, today's Easter. We're celebrating something very specific today. So here's what happened three days before Easter. Luke 23, 46. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. So do you know what this is? Death touched Jesus right here. And when death touches you, you die and you stay dead, right? 100% of the time. This is the most sure thing that there is. Death is undefeated, it has a perfect record. When death touches you, you stay dead. This is more sure than if your kid's grimy hand touches your sleeve and your sleeve getting dirty. This is more sure than jumping in a mud puddle with white shoes and your white shoes getting dirty. This is more sure than somebody without leprosy touching somebody who has leprosy and the person without leprosy getting leprosy. This is the most certain thing we know. When death touches you, you die and you stay dead. So when death touched Jesus, for three days it looked like it worked as it always had worked. Jesus was in a cold grave. Hell was rejoicing. His, his followers scattered because everybody believed this is gonna work exactly the way it always has worked. He died and he's gonna stay dead. Oh man. On Easter morning, he accomplished the greatest of grand reversals in the history of reversals, a resurrection the impossible. He walked out of his grave. Death lost. Death never loses. Death lost. And by the way, just so you know, I don't think that's some like mysterious, like spiritual, metaphorical thing. I believe that Jesus literally died and literally walked out of the grave. 
And I believe that is so vitally important to us because now we don't live as those with no hope, that we believe that when we die, we also don't have to stay dead. This is the most important truth that there ever was. But it's even cooler than that, if it can be. I want to read you like the coolest flex in the history of flexes. Do you ever get annoyed with people when they brag a little bit? Jesus is allowed to brag. So Jesus is going to talk about himself here. And I just want you, like this is the coolest thing that anyone has ever said. It's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Jesus says, I am the living one. I died. (laughs) You can't say that. I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. How awesome is that? Again, I've heard some people flex before. Hey, I, you know, I got this car or I've done this thing or I won this thing or I earned this thing. No, how about I got the keys to hell right here? Jingling in his hand. So it's not just that Jesus resurrected. The reversal is that when death touched Jesus, <laughs> he didn't stay dead and he dealt death a death blow. Death died, trampling over death by death. This empty tomb. He beat it. He beat it for us. Death dies. The sin that separated you is now separated from you. The king has risen. Amen. Amen. I want you to know you're the first service to clap for that. You guys are more Christian than the other ones. So here's what I want to do. We're going to sing a couple of songs here. And if you're a Christian, man, I want to invite you into this moment. Can you have a moment with God? Maybe it's been a while. You just lean into this. These words are deep. And even if you don't sing, man, whisper them under your breath. Lean into this moment. This is a celebration. Something happens when you engage your heart and your soul in this, in worshiping God on this day of all days. Lean into this moment. Let these words sink deep into your soul. Let this be a true resurrection Sunday. Pray with me. Jesus, I pray for the person who who maybe has never had a relationship with you. Maybe they've felt this separation from you for whatever reason. They have not felt like they could approach you. Oh Lord, help them to know. Help them to know that you can't wait for them to approach. Help them to know that you would reach out your hand and and heal them and cleanse them in an instant. That you would not reject. Oh, I pray that they would know what it feels like to have their sin rocketed across the universe. The sin that separates them from you be separated from them. Pray that they would do that right now, that they would pray to you right now to give you their lives. And Lord, I pray for the Christians in the room right now, Lord, that this would be real. That it wouldn't just be the go through the motions Easter thing again, Lord, that we would be able to be impacted in mind, body, and spirit right now in this moment that you really did rise from the dead. And that means everything that we are forgiven, we are cleansed, and we can enjoy an unbroken relationship with you. I pray that that would be real, that the Christians who've been running from you would come back, and today would be a new day with you. Thank you for the cross, and thank you for that empty tomb. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to respond and worship together.